Right, like, uh, uh, well, everyone else on the panel and many other people, I'm sure, in the uh, audience, I first came across Kipling as a child, and I'll never forget the immortal lines. Now I'm the king of the swingers, the jungle <laughs> VIP. I've reached the top and had to stop, and that's what's bothering me. Well, I'm um, sorry. It was the 1967 Disney cartoon movie, The Jungle Book, a global smash hit, I'm sure many of you are aware, which I went to see at the Pearly Odeon with my dad and my sisters very soon after it came out. And I wish I could report that it was the beginning of a lifelong enthusiasm uh, for Kipling, but it wasn't. Um, I read The Jungle Book uh, and Just So Stories, uh, fairly soon after seeing the film, but I didn't really like them. Uh, as Kipling enthusiasts said at the time, the film was not at all true to his stories. And well, at the age of seven, I wanted the lyrics of Wanna Be Like You and Bare Necessities uh, and not what I actually got. Um, Kipling didn't speak to me on my first encounter, and no one really encouraged me to explore further. I read Kim after The Jungle Book and Just So Stories, but didn't really quite understand it at the age of eight. And I came across Gunga Din, Recessional, If and the White Man's Burden, Kipling's greatest hits, if you like, uh, as a teenager when I started reading poetry. But that was it. Kipling wasn't on the secondary school English literature syllabus in the 1970s, thanks to F.R. Leavis and his followers in Cambridge. The only late 19th and early 20th century poets uh, we were supposed to take seriously were Gerald Manley Hopkins, uh, the First World War poets at a pinch, and of course the great modernists. So Eliot and Pound. And no one I knew recommended Kipling or explained why he mattered. For years, I dismissed him, largely unread, it has to be said, as old-fashioned and reactionary, both in his jingoistic politics and in his style of writing. It's only in middle age that I've really got to know and appreciate Kipling's work. And that's been as a byproduct of my interest in the politics and popular culture of British imperialism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, rather than out of any, uh, well, sort of sense that uh, I've got to read him because he's a great uh, prose stylist or a great poet. By contrast, I took to Orwell as soon as I discovered Animal Farm at the age of 12, on the recommendation of my grandfather, who'd been a tribune reader in the 1940s, when Orwell was the paper's literary editor. By the time I was 14, I'd worked my way through all his novels and books of reportage. Uh, I stopped exploring Orwell for a time when I went to university. Uh, he was as absent from the reading list uh, on politics, philosophy and economics at Oxford uh, in the late 70s and early 80s as Kipling had been from the English language, uh, sorry, English literature uh, syllabus that I in A-level. But I discovered his essays and journalism in my early 20s and have been a devotee ever since. Now, I'm not claiming that my haphazard reading history teaches a general lesson Everyone's missed key authors, and Kipling was by no means my only one. Uh, I'd never read Jonathan Swift or Daniel Defoe or Charles Dickens or George Eliot or George Gissing until my 20s or 30s, and well, some of them actually in my 40s. And everyone has their misplaced enthusiasms as well. Uh, mine as a teenager were Aldous Huxley and George Bernard Shaw, both of whom I devoured, and neither of whom I can now stand. But, well, OK, uh, you knew there was a but coming there. My experience isn't entirely irrelevant. It reflects the times in which I've lived. I was born in 1959 at the height of the Cold War, and Orwell, although he died in 1950, was then and remained throughout my early adult life an author who addressed directly the most, political, uh, the most important political ph phenomenon of what Eric Hobsbawm called the short 20th century, the impacts of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia and the, gender, the, the degeneration of that revolution into a totalitarian police state. Kipling, by contrast, dealt with a world that had passed long ago, the era of aggressive imperialism when Britannia ruled the waves, and old joke, waved the rules. Now, today, the context has changed. We're more than 20 years from the collapse of communism in East Central Europe, and the past 10 or 15 years have seen what on first sight appears to have been an extraordinary revitalisation of the imperialist spirit among the governments of the rich industrialised world. I don't need to remind you about Afghanistan and Iraq, and as I speak, planes from the British and French Air Forces are bombarding Gaddafi's positions in Libya. The white man's burden uh, is back big time, in other words, or so it seems. So, is it all over for Orwell and time for a Kipling revival? I don't think so. I'll accept that Kipling was a great populist and popular poet who deserves a wide audience, and I'll accept that the Bolshevik Revolution and its aftermath 
no longer matter in the way they did for 40 years after Orwell's death. But I still think that Orwell remains a more relevant uh, writer for our age. The reason is that Orwell was, and well is, much more than a novelist of his time and a chronicler of social conditions and political events uh, that are now largely of historical interest. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that his novel should be dismissed as anachronisms or that his great books of reportage, Down and Out in Paris and London, The Road to Wigan Pier, Homage to Catalonia, are quaint uh, re records of a lost world. Uh, Animal Farm and 1984 are much more than historically specific satires, and even the novels of the 1930s, though flawed and very dated in many respects, have worn rather better, it seems to me, than the work of most of Orwell's peers. The books of reportage remain models of how to do it. But if all that Orwell had done was the novels and books of reportage, which would have been a fair bit, it has to be said, I don't think he'd have quite the current relevance that he has. For me, it's Orwell as an essayist and as a columnist, Orwell the intellectual journalist, if you like, that matters most in the early 21st century. Now, five years ago, I put together a collection of his As I Please columns for Tribune for a book to mark the paper's 70th anniversary, something I've been meaning to do since I was the paper's uh, reviews editor, Orwell's old job, in the 1980s. I was familiar with the material and knew it would make a good book, uh, but I slightly worried that there would be too much that was obscure uh, to today's reader. My concerns evaporated as I was working on the editing. Yes, the columns needed uh, footnotes. Uh, yes, they needed a certain amount of explanation. But for the most part, they were as accessible and as fresh as the day they were written. His range of subject matter as a journalist, not just in the Tribune columns, but across the board in his work for Horizon, Partisan Review, Polemic, and a host of other little magazines, uh, as well as in The Observer and The Manchester Evening News, is extraordinary. His prose style, precise and demotic. Politics in the English language, some thoughts on the common toad, why I write, all will be read for as long as there are readers, in the same way that Swift and Defoe and Milton will be read forever. And Kipling, well, he's certainly fascinating, he's certainly important. And I'd agree with Orwell that he's a more complex and more honest writer than his left and liberal critics claim, or many of them. Uh, I don't think he can be simply dismissed as a crude racist and he didn't work on the assumption that any white man was superior to any other, though he did assume the overall superiority of the white man's civilization and of his military, and saw no possibility of bringing to an end the white man's burden of, of uh, governing the world through empire, except too that he uh, defended the underdog, although it was very much more uh, the underdog of the British forces occupying India uh, than the underdog in the sense of the Indians. Uh, his worst poetry is a little better than doggerel, I think, but his best has a vigour that's undiminished by time. And he's a lucid writer of prose, like Orwell, a master of economy, direct in his style. But in the end, uh, I'm with Orwell when he says, it's no use pretending that Kipling's view of life as a whole can be accepted or even forgiven by any civilised person. Kipling is a jingo imperialist. He is morally insensitive and aesthetically disgusting. It is better to start by admitting that and then try to find out why it is that he survives while the refined people who have sniggered at him seem to wear so badly. I'm afraid you can't read Kipling except in the context of his time. Orwell again. Kipling belongs very definitely to the period 1885 to 1902. The Great War and its aftermath embittered him, but he shows little sign of having learned anything from any event later than the Boer War. It's a brutal verdict, but one I think is accurate.